And we're going to start off this morning with a presentation, Dairy Data and Technologies, Past, Present, and Future by Dr. Jeff Buley. He's the Data and Analytics and Innovation Scientist for Holstein uh, Association USA, and you're very fortunate to have him in-house uh, with your association. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Buley to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for a few good mornings there. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about data and technologies and innovation. It's, I think we've got a great program that, that Cheryl's put together for us today and looking forward to the point where I can just listen to everybody else instead of being up here under pressure. So when I started thinking about this, I really thought, how did I become the old guy? Because if you're talking about past, present, and future, that means somebody thinks you've got like a long-term perspective on this, and I thought I was still relatively young, um, not super young like Mac here, but um, relatively young. Well, technology is what made me old, I think, and data is what made me old. You see here on the, on the left, there's a picture of me during my PhD working with a technology. You can see I've got a nice big smile. I'm still working on in the back end of the cow. Uh, that's why I'm wearing my Purdue tie today. Anybody else a Boilermaker here? No Boilermakers here. All right, we've got a few. <laughs> Good, a few. Um, and that's me on the right. That picture was taken last week working with technologies at the Smart Holstein Lab. I've been through a, a lot of challenges and, and some real successes too, but it's been a challenge. And I, and I have my story here to start with of when I was a kid, I walked uphill both ways in the snow to school. So let me just explain some of the things that, that I've seen and some of the things that I had to do. So those of you that are younger working in technologies now might have forgotten that these things happen. But on the upper left is one of the first wearable technologies. It's called an ice cube that was a leg tag, and I worked with some of those back at the beginning of, of my time in technology, and there was no transmission of data automatically. You had to, to take the tag off the cow, you had to connect it with a cable to a computer, and you had to use a toothpick to get the sand out of the prongs there to, to get that thing to connect. And it would take about one to two hours for all the data to download onto your computer from one tag. Then you see a, a picture of, of a raccoon. Raccoons have been the bane of my existence in technology. Nobody ever talks about raccoons and rodents in technology, but raccoons are particularly challenging because their hands are so talented. I have seen them unplug things. I have seen them eat cable. They're a huge technology issue that nobody ever thinks about. On the upper right, you see some of the proof of concept work that, that we did during my PhD, looking at automatic body condition scoring. And it's a little bit ironic that we called it automatic body condition scoring because you see those 23 points around that cow's back? I clicked on those with a mouse on about 3,000 images. That was my job. I developed a callus on my hand from a mouse. Anybody ever had a mouse callus? It's never left. It wasn't there before my PhD, and it's never left because I clicked on that. That wasn't automatic. And then on the bottom right is some work where we were working with a temperature monitoring technology, and we wanted to explore. It was a room temperature monitor, and we wanted to explore what the impact of water intake was on room and temperature. And it wasn't automatic. You had to pass a panel to get the read for that temperature. Normally, that would have just been during milking, but we needed to do it more often. So we had the cows, and we just ran them in circles for a few hours around the, the, the reader. And you can see, with my friend Mike Grott there, the herd manager at Purdue, they didn't want to do that after a few times. Cows don't like to run in circles. So that's my, we have to walk I had to walk uphill both ways to school story about technology. We've seen a lot, and I think that's why I'm here, up here talking about the past, present, and the future of technology. So what's the past? Well, we know that we've been involved 
in dairy for many, many years. There's evidence that up to 7,000 years ago, there was some type of dairy farming occurring. A lot happened in between then and where we're headed with some specific dates. I don't know what happened. I'm sure that there were people that were recording some things on tablets. I'm sure that there were many forms of paper records over the years, um, but I don't know all the details of what happened 2,000 years ago. I wasn't around, I'm not quite that old. In 1885, the Holstein Friesian Association was formed. Holstein Friesian Association of America at that time. So that was one of the first indications of, of good record keeping occurring, the value of the registration of animals, and, and of course we're here today as part of that association. In 1908, the first DHI organization was established. Very important time in our industry and still a very important source of data for our industry. In 1936, the first sire evaluations were completed. So we've been doing sire evaluations for almost 100 years now. Switching areas a little bit, in 1945, the first NRC for dairy cattle nutrition was created. In the 1950s, there was a guy named W. Edwards Deming. Okay, this is not dairy specific, but really important. Deming is the forefather of a lot of what we're talking about in the areas of data and analytics. He was one that, that developed a lot of the quality control, the statistical process control type of concepts that are prevalent throughout the world in every industry. And I think it's important to recognize that when we think about the history of data, we shouldn't think that we did it all in dairy. There's a lot of concepts that we brought from other industries and a lot of things from somebody like like Deming that we've used very successfully in the dairy industry. And we have a long history of farm record keeping. So I thought about my history in farm record keeping and I went back, I, I have the, the record book from our home farm and there in 1988 is the first time I wrote down something in the herd record book. So there's my first handwriting. And hand records are still important in, in many parts of our industry. That's not what we're talking about today as much but that was part of the beginning, and I'm sure that my, my beginning was in 1988, but others have done it much longer than that. And we have breeding wills, lots and lots of technologies, uh, of, of data sources that we've used over the years. And that's advanced, of course. Uh, we have great examples of herd management software in our industry, wonderful resources there that were really our first entry for many of us into dairy data in a more formalized form, and, and those have helped us a lot, and, and those softwares continue to develop and improve. A few years ago, Dr. Ray Nebel, who many of you know, developed this timeline uh, of technologies. So when we think about these, this idea of attaching a, an animal, attaching a tag to an animal as being something new, but if you go back into history, it actually started in the 1970s. It was the first time that people were thinking about using technologies for monitoring activity in animals. And those technologies have continued to develop and be refined over the years to where now you don't have to take that device and plug it in and use a toothpick to get it to work. That all, all that data now communicates wirelessly and continuously. And these six systems are very successfully adopted all around our industry, all around the world today. In 2009, the first genomic evaluations were conducted, and this is a very important type of data that we use. Uh, every day, most of us in this room are, are quite involved with that, and a major advancement for genetics. The most important thing I think we need to recognize here, as we talk about analytics and big data and all the buzzwords, the dairy industry was big data long before it was cool to be big data. We've been doing big data in the dairy industry for many, many years. And so I, I think we need to recognize the history and the importance of what's been done through organizations like DHI, through ration balancing, all that we've done in nutrition. We've been doing big data for many, many, many years. 
It's just now more cool to talk about big data. <clears throat> and I really think that analytics or how we use data on dairy farms is the next big scientific breakthrough. We've had huge scientific breakthroughs <clears throat> in areas of reproductive physiology, genetics, nutrition, general physiology, but I think analytics is our next scientific breakthrough. A lot of what we're going to see in, in the rest of our careers is how we utilize data in our dairy industry. And there are a few things that are setting the stage for that. First of all, there have been a lot of technological innovations outside of our industry that have set this stage. So cloud computing has opened up a lot of new doors, robots and sensors, the internet of things, drones, image analysis. We have so much more computational power than what we did last year, 10 years from now, 30 years, it doesn't matter what point, we have so much more power on the farm with what we can do data. Visual analytics, how we look at data. Again, a lot of concepts being brought from other industries that we're bringing into the dairy industry. GPS technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, genomics, metabolomics, how we analyze data. There's a lot of new concepts coming in how to look at data in, in ways statistically that maybe we wouldn't have thought about in previous years. At the same time, there are a lot of external drivers driving the need for this data. We're increasingly concerned about food safety, food security, traceability, more accountability for what we do on farms, animal well-being, environmental sustainability. We're working in a more competitive global market. We have more climatic variation and we have more challenges with labor. So all these things are setting the stage for us to really take advantage of all these new sources of data and innovation in our industry. Some people have even claimed that this is the second green revolution. That's how big of a deal this data revolution is for our industry. And big data, analytics, again, whatever buzzword you want to use, is a really important factor for our industry moving forward. This slide's a couple of years old now, but it was developed by a company just to show all of the different players that are involved in the livestock technology arena. And if we expand this now, we'll see many, many more. But there are lots of companies. Some of these are, are companies that are represented here today that have been around for decades. Some of them are startups. Um, actually, if we look at this slide, we can point out a couple of startups that are no longer around. And there's some startups that are, that are here today that aren't on this. And we're going to continue to see more and more investment, more and more players getting into this. And the interesting thing is behind these companies a lot of times are players like Google and Microsoft and Apple that are investing in these technologies because they see the power of data in livestock. So let's just talk about some of the, the types of data that we have in our industry. I talked about dairy management software. I think that's probably the, the baseline for what we do. Another huge area, and in my mind, probably the second most important technology or source of data that we can have on our dairy farms is feed management software. There's been a lot of these that have been around for many years, a few new ones on the block here in the last couple years. An extremely important piece of data for our largest cost on our dairy operations. So feed is, is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of our cost and a lot of opportunities to control and manage feed through feed management software. There's some neat things coming in terms of augmented reality, being able to see what data we have in the air, essentially, by, by wearing these, these, uh, these goggles, if you will. So that's a neat way to visualize and look at data in the future. One piece of data that I think we've really not taken advantage of enough is the human resources data. Humans on our operations have a lot of impact on what happens, and we don't collect a lot of data with that. This is a system called PeopleCore that collects data with who's doing what, when, and I think that that could be really important for helping us tie into other systems so that we can understand that there's a change in milk quality that was related to a new milker crew, or that there was a change in 
conception rate related to a change in who the breeder was. And this is not necessarily very expensive technology to, to invest in, and I think that's one of the most important things we can think about is not every technology has to be a $100,000 investment. Some technologies can be $500 investments or $1,500 investments, and we actually need more of those $500 and $1,500 options on our, our dairy farms. Not everything has to be a $100,000 or, or a million dollar investment. <clears throat> this is a neat system called Sonomus, which does intensive in-barn monitoring. So this is a system, a company out of Italy. It monitors temperature humidity index, which is relatively simple to, to measure. It measures methane, it measures ammonia, a lot of things in barn that we can explore what we're doing to air quality, not just for the environment, but also for the individual animals themselves. A lot of the area that, that I've worked in is what we refer to as precision dairy monitoring. And we're going to talk a lot more in depth about precision dairy monitoring. This is looking at individual animals and we're monitoring them across time. We might be monitoring something in the milk, we may be monitoring something physiological, something behavioral, or something with the conformation of the animal. And in general, we're monitoring that variable across time and using a management by exception approach. We're trying to follow the natural variation in whatever we're looking at. Let's take activity, for example, and we're looking for identifications of outliers, an increase in activity that indicates that a cow's in heat, a decrease in rumination that indicates a cow's sick. Those are the types of things we're doing with these technologies. And there are many examples of how we can apply this technology on our farms. Estrus detection is the most widely adopted and probably the most successfully adopted. We can also use these, these technologies for mastitis detection, fresh cow disease detection, lameness detection, calving detection. These technologies have potential to provide us new genetic traits, and we can take that data and aggregate it at the group level or the herd level to do management monitoring. And there are dozens and dozens of these technologies. I kind of divide them into three categories. We have the wearable technologies, the machine vision based technologies, and the milk biomarkers. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. I think one of the hardest things to do from your seats as a breeder or producer is to decide if I want a technology, which one do I invest in? Because there are so many options out there. Last year, at this meeting, we launched the, the WKU Smart Holstein Lab. This is Holstein Association's effort to explore technologies and help the industry move forward in dairy technology and data. And you see here an example of the technologies that we have. Our cows at the Smart Holstein Lab have as much bling as any cows in the world. They've got ear tags, they've got neck tags, they've got leg tags, they've got vaginal devices, they've got rumen boluses. We have devices all over these cows to explore what this data means and how valuable it can be, what are some of the challenges that we have in working with these technologies. There's lots of them, believe me. Um, and, and using that to help you as, as a breeder or as a producer understand how you can use data on your farm. There are technologies that are basically real-time location systems. So these are technologies that are looking at the position of the animal within the barn using a concept called triangulation, just identifying based on the strength of signal to beacons within the barn where those animals are, where they're spending their time. The concept has been proposed that maybe sometimes we shouldn't have the device on the outside of the animal, but rather inside the animal. Maybe we put something under the skin of the animal and the ear, for example. And there's a new technology coming out relatively soon from a company called Core Data that's actually proposing that they can put a chip on the ear of the animal and be able to measure progesterone, blood urea nitrogen, BHBA, NEFA, body temperature, potentially cortisol, a number of different variables where they're measuring physiologically what's happening with that animal rather than behaviorally. So an interesting technology, this is a very, very early stage, uh, but I think maybe this is something we can look toward in the future, being able to move 
more from behavior to physiology to be more specific of what we're looking at with the animal. One of the neat things with this data is that we can change the way we manage the animal. So with these technologies, we can develop cow responsive environments. Typically when we think about heat stress, which I think about a lot this time of the year in Kentucky, we're listening to the outside conditions, the temperature humidity, as far as when to turn our fans and our soakers on. But maybe we can use these technologies to listen to what the cow's saying, because the cow's experience with heat stress isn't just what's happening right now, it's what's happened over the last few days. And with these technologies, if we're measuring core body temperature or rumination or eating time, we can use those as the variables to determine when to turn our soakers on, our fans on, instead of the outside conditions. And another concept that's been introduced recently is the idea that we can use this data to create a risk management strategy. So there's a company uh, called Farm Life that's actually developed an insurance program for when periods where we have more heat stress than what's anticipated so that you actually can help manage the risk around heat stress by monitoring the animals. And we would be remiss if we didn't think about the environmental impact of the animals that we work with. Now this is a pretty intense technology here that you see in, in the picture for measuring methane emissions. But there's some other options like the C-lock technology that allow us to do this perhaps a little bit, uh, a little bit easier uh, to measure methane emissions. We have to think about methane emissions. One of the biggest areas that I think we've missed so far in terms of data is calf data. Calves are the future of our herd. There's a lot that we can identify from our automatic calf feeder systems. There are system sensors specific to the, to the calf. The picture on the upper right is, is for a stall. So if we have cows in, in hutches or in a stall, we can monitor their behavior for sickness and so forth. So I think this is a hugely untapped area is, is calf data. A lot of what we've seen so far in the area of technology has been around the concept of wearable technologies. I really think that we're going to see a lot more here in, in the next decade in machine vision and milk biomarkers. There's some reasons why this concept really works well. The biggest is we can take a fixed cost and spread it over our more animals. And the, these areas, particularly the machine vision area, is advancing so rapidly outside of the dairy industry that there's a lot of new techniques that we can take advantage of for the animal industry. And you see a, a lot of new companies coming along, some of them here today, to talk about their technologies. I think this is a very, very exciting area. And then specifically looking at milk biomarkers, we have a lab set up for us. Our milking parlor is a lab. As a scientist, that's exciting because we're already collecting a biological sample from our animal two or three times a day. We just aren't fully capitalizing on what we can collect from that sample. And, and there's some neat things coming down the line for milk biomarkers. Some of these technologies are, are really looking specifically at how to monitor the behavior of the animal looking specifically at, at eating behavior, resting behavior, that sort, of, that sort of thing. There's a lot of potential for monitoring what animals do. So this is an, an example of a technology where they're monitoring whether animals are lying, eating, staining at the bunk, staining uselessly, et cetera. This, this one particular technology doesn't identify which cow is doing what, but it identifies and gives us a time budget for the herd. We could also use this kind of technology to monitor something like locomotion behavior. So this is a study that, that I was involved with a few years ago where we're looking at limb movement, the position of each limb as it, the cow moves to be able to use machine vision to identify when cows are becoming lame. This technology could also be used for monitoring the feed bunk, identifying how much feeds in the bunk at different sections at different points in the day. There's even a company, Viking Genetics, that's developed a technology to measure individual animal feed intake using machine vision. Now, if you look at that, there's a lot of cameras involved in that. This is not a very, very big herd, but it's monitoring individual animal feed intake 
uh, with, with machine vision. I think this is exciting stuff. And cost, okay, that, that is some, something that we know yet, but really neat that we could do this technologically. And there are technologies looking at things like body condition scoring. So D. Laval has a system out that's, that's measuring individual animal body condition scoring, and other people have developed similar technologies, lots of publications on the concept of body condition scoring that don't involve a callus on the mouse. Again, looking at milk biomarkers, there's so many neat companies that are working on technologies. The major milk equipment companies, startup or younger companies like Soma Detect, looking at monitoring individual animal somatic cell count, milk components, reproductive hormones like progesterone, nutritional indicators, disease markers, welfare indicators, and even looking at methane efficiency, methane emissions uh, through variables in the milk. There's so much that we can measure. We've just barely scratched the surface of what we can measure in the milk itself. So how do we avoid the drip dilemma? where we're data rich and information poor. I think sometimes that is what's happening on our farm today. We have lots of data, but we're poor with the information. One of the areas is, is to think about how we visualize the data. And when I look at a system, I wanna understand a little bit about what we see in the software interface. These are the things that I'd like to see. I'd like to see a cloud-based interface, a smartphone application, I want to see something that addresses the needs of both visual and verbal learners. This has been a really hard lesson for me. We all think that other people think like we do, but they don't. I'm a very visual person. You can probably gather that from my slides. I like pictures, I like graphs, I hate tables. One of my colleagues at Agritech Analytics, who just retired, Bill Vabort, loves tables. He loves to see data and see the numbers. And it was great for us to learn from each other because everything we would see, I want to see it in a graph and he wants to see it in a table. Guess what? Neither of us are right, but neither of us are wrong. The reality is that's humans. Some of us are visual, some of us are more verbal, we want to see the numbers, and we need to be developing our platforms that address the needs of both learners. When I used to teach, a lot of students would say, I love, your, I love your presentations. You use lots of pictures, visual, it's great. And then every once in a while I have a student come up to me and say, I hate your presentations. They're terrible. You never put any words on your slides. I need words. And I realized I was making a mistake because I, they weren't thinking like me. And that, that's okay, that's good that they weren't thinking like me. But I needed to change the way that I thought about delivering information. And we need to think about this as we're developing software and, and ways of presenting data also. We need to have an intuitive user interface. The user interface has to be relatively easy to use. At this point, most of us have used the internet, most of us use a smartphone, and there's a certain logic, heuristics is the term that's used, to how things flow within a software interface. We need interconnectivity with herd management software. We need real-time data. I want to look at something that, that's right now. I don't want to look at something from a week ago. I want to see something that, that tells me what's happening right now with my herd. And we need indicators of what's most important and what's most actionable. Because there's a lot of data on our dairy farm. Without a single technology, there's a lot of data. And we need some indication of what's the most important things to look at and where are places where I can take action? And we really need customer-focused support and training. This is one area that I think a lot of early technologies failed on, is not providing that good customer support to help people learn how to use the system. And I have seen this has improved a lot over the years, but that's extremely important for adoption of technologies. We have challenges that we have to think about with data. Here's some of the challenges that I, can, that I see. Inconsistent data entry. Data entry is still an issue. We all, as humans, make mistakes. We have a lot of paper trails. Paper trails create opportunities for errors. It's not always popular to talk about, but rural connectivity is a challenge still. 
I live in a rural area. I have internet problems. It frustrates the heck out of me. And I know that I'm not the only one in this room that has internet problems. And it's easy for a company that's sitting in a, in a large city to say this isn't a problem, but it is a problem in rural areas and we have to think about how we address that. Information overload is a challenge. There's way too much information to be able to sort through and that's why we have to really hone in on what's important and what's actionable. And I think it's sometimes just overwhelming how many options there are. As a dairy producer, you're managing an investment portfolio and you have to think about what the next things that you invest in and that could be technology or it could be something else. There are limitations we have to think about. We have brand differences in measures. Just because one technology says it's measuring rumination time and another one's measuring rumination time doesn't mean they're doing it the same way or that the two numbers are equal. These technologies do fail. Believe me, I was dealing with two or three technology failures yesterday. This still happens a lot. There's a lack of standardization. There's, a, there's concerns about how often should we calibrate these technologies so that they're measuring accurately. Issues around data ownership and who pays for what with this data. I get the question a lot about, is this data for big farms or small farms? To me, this is not a question that we should be asking. The trend toward rapid use of data is rapid. Small dairies can take advantage of data too. Too often we fall into the trap. If I'm milking 50 cows or 150 cows of saying, that doesn't matter for me, that's only for the big guys. I say wrong because the biology of the animal and business management principles are not size dependent. The biology of that animal is the same and we can take advantage of data in small dairies just as well as we can in large data dairies. There's different challenges we have to think about and Dr. Overton is going to talk about that some, but this data is for small farms too. What are some of the lessons that we've learned? Be careful with early stage technologies. It's harder with early stage technologies. The innovation can be amazing. And I've worked with early stage technologies where I had headaches five years ago or 10 years ago that are beautiful and work perfectly today. But it's harder when you're working with an early stage technology. Be prepared for little things to go wrong. The raccoon unplugging your cable, the lightning that strikes. These things happen and we have to be prepared to how we handle them. Realize it takes a few months to learn how to use the data. We don't turn the system on and suddenly we know everything that we need to learn from that system. It takes time. And data integration is challenging and I know you'll hear a lot about that through the day. Sometimes I fall into the trap of, of getting a little bit down, if you will, on, on some of the, the things that we see from data, but I have to remind myself, these technologies aren't perfect, but perfection is the enemy of progress. Sometimes they're not perfect, but they're way better than what we could have done before. They're way better. Tomorrow's technological innovations are beyond what we can imagine. So we need to dream big. We need to dream big about what we can do with technologies. Other industries are going to introduce technologies that open new doors. I don't think we can imagine what we're going to be able to do with technologies and data 10 years from now or 20 years from now because we don't know what technology is going to be created by the automobile industry or some other industry that we can steal that technology and bring it over to the dairy industry. I think we'll see a shift in focus. We're now talking a lot about reproduction and health. I think we're going to see a shift in focus to animal well-being and environmental sustainability. We'll see better options for data integration. Our focus will shift more to decision support. The machine learning algorithms and how we use the data will be more important than the technology itself. And we're going to see a paradigm shift as we move away from the early adopters to the early and late majority. Their needs are different than those first people that bought something just because it was cool to buy. We'll have more data-driven dairy producers. They understand statistics to some degree. They treat data as an asset. They connect production to finance. They look forward, not backwards, and they manage with KPIs. I ask everybody, who is your chief information officer, your CIO? 
Everybody will need somebody that at least performs this duty if it's not a full-time position at some point in the future. And no matter what, we need to remember to never lose sight of her, that beautiful creature that we all love. She's the center of what we do, and we have to keep her and her biology in mind as we work through data. I'm excited about where we are, and I'm excited to hear from the rest of the presentations today. Thank you for your attention.